Thank you so much, Tasha. Hey, everyone. I'm Max. I'm the director of gaming solutions here at Aluma. And, you know, I, th I thought it might be interesting to talk a little bit about what a modern architecture for gaming analytics looks like. Aluma has been creating ETL as a service for many years now. We work with customers that you probably have engaged with, like Wargaming and Lumosity and Wizards. And, and I was hoping to show you a little bit about what we've learned in this space and then talk about what it would take to build something from the ground up. So today we'll get a little bit into the problems you're facing, how a SaaS solution or building your own solution using some open source technologies could be uh, fit. We'll do a live demo of some of the elements of Illuma that could be interesting for what you're working on. And then of course, we'll have time for some summary and questions at the end. So first of all, let's talk about the cloud. I, I think it's pretty obvious for most of the, the customers that we deal with and, and most of the, the kind of consultants we're working with that everyone's thinking about cloud as probably the best option if you're building ETL from scratch today. And if you're trying to get real-time events in particular, trying to manage and, and kind of do this on-site on your own becomes a really cumbersome challenge. And what we've actually noticed beyond just the basics of what cloud offers in terms of scalability and manageability, you do actually get more ubiquity of data throughout your whole organization. So think about in the days of old, it was the data engineers and the data scientists that would collaborate on, okay, here's the data I'm sending, here's the data I wanna make available, and then I wanna run some reports and actually see the results. And it was a very, uh, you know, it, an, it was an iterative process between a very small subset of the organization. What we're finding by having data available in more of a cloud hosted solution, like a, a data warehouse such as Redshift or Snowflake or BigQuery, is you're making data available to much larger component of the organization without necessarily impeding the data itself. So now marketing can take a look and add Salesforce and Marketo data. Business units can add data from you know, uh, their support tickets. They can actually start to see significantly more than just the basic game events only for product. You can start to bring it together with other information. And we're actually seeing this across multiple business lines, not just gaming. Everyone has data. Everyone's trying to bring it together and make it available to their entire organization. So this has been a nice side benefit of cloud-based uh, solutions. So you're thinking, okay, I know I wanna use the cloud. How do I get my data there? And oftentimes I hear from data engineers or, or business intelligence teams, it's simple, I'll just write a script. It should be no problem. And in basic essence, that's true. But I think the problem is, as you see more and more types of data sources and the ever-changing kind of needs that your organization has, what starts as a simple project and could have been a simple script becomes a manageability nightmare. We see with our customer base that there's a significant number of data sources they work with. And maybe I could bucket it into four key categories, flat files like CSVs or JSON lines. Maybe you're going to have some sort of transactional database like MySQL, Postgres, MongoDB, SQL Server. Oftentimes you'll have SaaS applications as well, such as uh, Salesforce or Marketo, or maybe you're using uh, you know, some game engines like Unity or Unreal and you're trying to get real time events from them. So it could be either SDKs or webhooks from these kinds of events. So you start to see that there's four main components there of where the data is coming from, but in the end, you just care about being able to analyze the data. So if, if you skip towards the right side here, you probably have some sort of analytic solution for visualization, such as Tableau, maybe Looker, or if you're extra savvy, you're just doing direct SQL queries right on the data warehouse itself. Most of our customers are using a cloud data warehouse today, like Redshift, BigQuery, Snowflake. Some of them prefer to go to an on-prem solution like MySQL or MemSQL. But it's that getting the data there that becomes a big challenge because you might lose data. It's kind of slow sometimes. It's not really getting the results you're looking for. And, and your, your team really has other priorities to focus on and it's just it's not scalable over time. So if you think about trying to build this from scratch on your own, you've probably considered a lot of what I'm about to show you. But in essence, of those four types of data sources we work with, you could even subcategorize those into two formats. The ones that are uh, you know, data stores that need to be queried of some sort and the ones that are pushing data on their own. So something that needs to be queried would be something like a transactional database, MySQL, MongoDB, Postgres. Some of these would be the cloud-based solutions like Salesforce where you have an API you have to leverage to query the data out of that, Marketo, Google Analytics, uh, Facebook ads. So you actually have to go and fetch tasks from this. 
A second type is something that's pushing events. And this is most often what we see from games to, to, uh, themselves. So it could be a web-based game, could use a JavaScript SDK. Mobile games would be iOS or Android SDKs. Maybe you're using a third-party SDK like Segment or Imparticle. So those are essentially pushing events in real time and need to be somehow aggregated and captured. Uh, and same thing from any kind of webhook or, or something that's coming from some SaaS applications like Jira even. So you need to have some sort of gateway or endpoint to receive these events. So that's the initial component in ETL in the cloud where you're extracting it. And by the way, even whether you're doing this in the cloud or not, the acronym stays the same. It's ETL and maybe another T at the end I'll explain in a moment. So once you have extracted the actual data itself, you need to normalize this for the platform you're working with because it's coming in in different formats from all of these data sources. So you want to normalize it so it's something that you're comfortable doing any transformations you might need to do, which of course might be, let's say you have a user agent string and you want to parse that out to multiple fields. Or let's say you have a string that's too long and you need to either truncate it or you want to split it up into multiple strings. So some basic fixing and cleansing there, maybe some timestamps you want to clean up. Beyond that, you might want to enrich the data before loading it into your data warehouse. So for example, a lot of our customers have IP addresses with the, the data that they're sending via an SDK, and they want to enrich that with some geolocation. So you could use a package to essentially transform that on the fly, add country, country code, zip code, and, and enrich it with data that wasn't actually available in the original event itself. Finally, you may want to merge events or split them into multiple schemas on your output. So again, you can do all of this on the fly in, the, in that second transform stage that you're probably going to build out. Next, you want to actually load the data to your data warehouse. And to do this, it depends which data warehouse you're going to, but of course your input data needs to match the schema on the output. So if you have not created a schema yet, you'll of course need to do so appropriately. If it's some sort of schema change, let's say you're adding a field and require a new column, then you'll have to update the schema on the output. You'll have to make sure to convert it to the output format. So for example, if you're trying to bring in a JSON line, uh, if you're going to Redshift, you might have to store this in just a long ver care. If you're doing this into Snowflake, it would be a variant. If you're doing this into BigQuery, it would be a record. So you can see you have to really figure out the appropriate type for the output. You're going to copy it to a staging environment. And this is essentially to make sure that you're getting the batches oriented properly. Uh, in the case of Aluma in particular, we do a format we call micro batching, which brings in the amount of data into a certain batch size before it gets loaded into the data warehouse. If it's a high volume of data, we increase the batch size dynamically. If it's a low volume of data, we decrease the batch size dynamically. And the reason for this is we want to make sure to load the data as quickly as possible and as efficiently as possible. So if it's a high volume, of course, increasing that batch size maintains low latency, but significantly a higher volume of data is still capable of being sent along. And I mentioned that there's another component here I like to call the, the ETLT, so another transform potentially that you probably are considering if you're already building this out yourself. And that's doing some sort of after the fact batch based transformations once the data is already in the data warehouse. So this could be a join of tables, it could be a merge of sorts or a cohort table, whatever you're trying to accomplish that necessarily couldn't be processed on an event by event level basis it might make sense to perform a SQL job every you know, X number of minutes or hours on the data warehouse itself. Now there's a challenge when you're trying to bring in data in real time and that's maintaining integrity. And I think the reason for this is when you're doing so in real time, it's essentially a streaming platform, one, your schemas are going to change. It's inevitable, you've all dealt with this. You need to figure out the best way to manage these dynamic schemas without driving yourself mad at trying to manually try, uh, you know, map these yourself. The second issue you might run into is errors. In fact, when I say might, it's, it's certain. You're going to have errors, it's inevitable. You're going to need to figure out how to make sure you don't lose data, but still keep the good data flowing, and then how to gracefully rectify those errors so that you can continue about getting real usable data. And the final piece is when you have a real-time pipeline and you want to get the, all the data transmitted, the, the issue becomes how do I make sure something is for sure transmitted, but not transmitted more than one time so that I don't have duplicates. So transmitting data exactly once becomes another key challenge. So let's first tackle how we handle dynamic schemas. 
So you can look at this as, you know, you're going to have new columns coming in and new tables being created from various inputs. Some of your inputs might not have a schema associated with it at all, like a NoSQL. Your product team, of course, is going to be performing A-B tests, so they're going to have different fields you hadn't expected, new features and new events. And then eventually, as I mentioned before, marketing and other business units are going to catch wind of your abilities, and they're going to want to bring in other inputs you hadn't necessarily considered. Uh, and even, you know, server logs and other backend monitoring tools are going to need to be monitored as well. So all of these different kinds of schemas are going to be constantly changing and it becomes a huge headache. So the way that Aluma actually first implemented a solution when we started building our platform was to try to guesstimate how a schema should be built out in the data warehouse. And the way we did this was essentially taking a sample of the events coming into the system and saying, okay, it looks like of these thousand events, most of them are integers, so let's map this to be an integer. And you know, this actually worked about 85 to 90% of the time. It was very successful. But the problem was when it didn't work, you didn't always know. So that 10% of the time when it wasn't appropriate, you wouldn't really know until you were already looking at the data in the data warehouse and found that it wasn't exactly what you were expecting. So we actually had a more complete solution we tried to implement and that is to actually schema import from anything that actually has a schema already. So for example, if you're importing data from MySQL, we query MySQL to get the current schema, copy that over into, let's say, Snowflake, and then of course, any translation that needs to occur, we handle that on the fly as well. For example, MySQL, it stores the length of a character differently than how Snowflake does, so there's an a uh, factor of four difference in the length there that has to be adjusted. And, and these are handled automatically on the fly, but it still handles the same type appropriately. So anything that has a schema, we can pull that from the original source. If it doesn't have a schema, it can still be inferred. And worst case scenario, if there's an error of any sort, that can be captured, which I'll show you in a second. So you say, okay, well, well, what about these errors? How do I actually handle those? I don't want to lose data, but I don't want to stop the good data, and I don't want to have to reload things. So how do I deal with errors? And you know, it's interesting. We looked across our entire customer base and took a sample of about a billion events. And across these samples, we found that there is a pretty good distribution of the most common errors. And the number one kind of error we see is some sort of failed value conversion. So you could think of this as something that came in as what looks like an integer, but was actually a timestamp, or maybe vice versa. It was mapped as a timestamp, but occasionally you'll have a zero value, which is not appropriate for a timestamp necessarily, and that could cause an error. Other situations you might run into, let's say you're resizing your data warehouse like Redshift, uh, or maybe it's unavailable, like you're using Snowflake and you decided to shut down the warehouse for a bit. If the data warehouse is unavailable and data is expecting to be loaded, of course, where does it go? Right, so that could be an error. Uh, and then you see some other lesser common errors here, like you're trying to push a string to what was mapped as an integer column. Maybe it was too long. The schema changed and you hadn't had it mapped appropriately before. And let's say you're doing some sort of custom logic on the fly and it didn't really work as expected. So any of these errors could occur along the way. And to be honest, you don't always know when to expect which of these will occur, which is why you need to have some sort of safety net to capture these. And Aluma's solution from the outset was to build a central catch-all event store that would, in addition to the error uh, event itself, would store the details about the error. And if you were to build something like this at any element or any component of your data pipeline, you would need to make sure that any of those could write to that catch-all error queue. In addition, because you're doing multiple stages in ETL and you don't exactly know where an error might have occurred, you're going to have to store the original unmodified event so that you can reprocess it if you wanted to make sure you actually get that data correctly. And lastly, you're going to need some sort of way to query or, or look at the actual errors that you have because you're going to have potentially hundreds of thousands or millions of these that are the same type. So you want to be able to classify and group it so you can prioritize the errors that you're checking. Now, one thing you want to make sure you, you're aware of is if you do create some sort of mechanism that pushes events aside, is what about pipeline loops? Like what if you split an event and it has an error and it just continues to split and so forth? So you have this loop of continuous errors. What if you have multiple pipeline destinations and one event successfully made it to one destination but not another? How do you actually split those correctly? And then you can see the complex processing starts to build from there depending on your use case. 
So the first implementation that we attacked in this, in this trying to really rectify the errors or catch them is essentially a Kafka queue to store all the failed events in their original format, and that's really important. We also stored metadata on each event that includes the reason for the failure and the number of times this failure has occurred, and that's to address the loop issue I mentioned a minute ago. We also created a notification service, which aggregates all the failure notifications by the type and other similar parameters and notifies the, the administrator. And the way we actually made, allowed you to see some samples of the errors was we kept these in Redis. So you can see samples of the errors. You can try to run these samples through any kind of uh, mechanism you have to rectify them and, and see the results. And this was a pretty good solution to start. You know, it actually gave us a lot of functionality to make sure we captured errors and could rectify them. But, you know, as we found pretty quickly, our customers said it's not enough. They needed more resolution into the errors and to see exactly what's going on. And the UI behind this was just not really sufficient to, to really rectify things on their own. So our next implementation of this was very similar in that we still captured the full event and all of the metadata but instead of using Redis, we implemented an Elasticsearch. So we're now capturing all the event errors instead of just samples. And in addition, we allow you to drill down into what kind of uh, input did this come from? What's the event type? Where is it going? What's the error type? So you can really granularly look at the kinds of errors and not have to scroll through 100,000 of them. You can kind of group them to see what's most important to you. Now, you're going to say, okay, how does this work? Does this mean I'm going to have duplicates? What if I'm resending old events, but a new event came in? How do I make sure that I'm not overwriting something that was correct after the fact? And that's a great question. I think that it's kind of a tough problem to really make sure that you transmit data at least once, but exactly once. Now, at least once is pretty straightforward. This has been solved before. If you think about like a TCP stack, uh, anytime a network event is being sent, it's getting an acknowledgement and therefore it doesn't send an event again. Now, if it doesn't get an acknowledgement for some reason, that acknowledgement was not sent or it wasn't received, it just resends the event. And therefore you're making sure that you're sending events and receiving them at least once. Now, if for some reason an acknowledgement was sent and, this, and the original sender didn't see that and it sends an event again, there's a sequence queue that the endpoint has. And if the endpoint number is higher than number of events then that was received, then it knows to just to skip that event. So it doesn't really have an issue in duplicates in that sense. Now, the problem with data is that you might not necessarily have a linear sequence and you might want to actually overwrite something from the past. So making sure that you sometimes are overwriting something or sometimes need to make sure something was received is a little more difficult. And the way you can address this in theory is item potency. So instead of making sure that something is sent exactly once, you make sure that even if it is sent more than once, that you're going to just overwrite a duplicate event by itself. So that you know the value is just, if it happens to be sent again, you're not actually impeding the data in any way, it just overwrites itself. Now in practice, this is still pretty difficult because then you have to figure out, well, what identifies an event? Is it the content? Is it the ID of the event? Not all data warehouses support item potency, so this becomes a challenge because they're expecting append-only data. And then every component in the pipeline could fail at some point, and you're not sure at what point it failed. So once it does come back up, it's likely to resend the last few events in its infrastructure once it has uh, restarted. So that, that could be a potential issue. You don't know where or at what point it's coming from. So the way that Aluma tackled this is we, we try to generate an event ID as early as possible in the process. So if you think about uh, from MySQL, we're pulling in the primary key. If possible, let's say from an SDK, from real-time events from your games, we generate an event ID as soon as the track function is called. So really at the very beginning of the process. We'd also suggest making these IDs sequential if you're building this out yourself, just for simplicity's sake. Now, one thing you'll notice, though, is that primary key constraints are not always validated on Redshift, for example. So overriding is not always an option. So one of the things that we do is we actually keep uh, a kind of shadow table. If, you, if you, any of you are Luma users today, you've probably noticed many of your tables have another copy of the table underscore meta. And this table is not just a full copy of the table. It's just keeping IDs of the batches that have been loaded to your system. 
so that in case we do have some sort of error, we want to make sure we're not reloading the same events over and over, you can just check the meta table. Now, if you were to build something like this, you'd have to essentially encompass the entire pipeline of your like with this implementation. So you need to have the ID go end to end, or you have to generate the ID that is managed step by step so that it can always reference that wherever the pipeline, uh, wherever the event might be in the pipeline. So does all of this work? Good question. I think that some of our customers would say, yeah, it does work. We've been, uh, you know, Wargaming has been working with us for a little while now. They originally had their own infrastructure that was bringing in events about 24 to 48 hours of latency from the time that they received them. And now they're getting the events in BigQuery literally within minutes. And I think that creates a paradigm shift in how business users expect to use data and the kinds of testing that they can do. So even in that organization, uh, more people are performing tests much more rapidly than they used to because they can, and they're able to therefore iterate quicker. Similarly with Lumosity, uh, they had a very large instance of MySQL they're trying to bring into their Redshift cluster. And the volume of data they worked with and the number of schema changes was just really uh, burden on the team. And they have a pretty large data engineering team, but they said, look, we have other priorities. This doesn't make sense for us to constantly try to manage this. We've tried six other services that failed. And with Aluma, they were able to actually get a functioning solution that, that really freed them up to work on other priorities that they see as a, as a more important need for the business than managing this ongoing. So I thought maybe we'll take some time to show you how this works. And this is a real live demo, so hopefully it, uh, you know, we'll get to see this all in action appropriately, and we'll have time for some questions about this at the end. So uh, Tasha, let me know if you can see my screen as I'm switching over here. I thought what I'd do first is show you a simple system. You know, this is a Luma when you log in, you see what's called our plumbing screen, which gives you the ability to add new inputs or to look at the inputs you already have. In my case, I have a few inputs already set up. I have a JavaScript SDK that I've set up for a game I'm about to play. I have a Python SDK from another game, some server logs, and I'm sending some webhook data as well. Every input that you have through a Luma goes through two stages before ultimately ending up in your data warehouse. The first is what we call our code engine, which allows for real-time transformations on the fly. And the second is the mapper, which handles all of the schema management for you, so you don't really have to do that manually on your own. If I did want to add a new input for the first time, I could just simply click Add New Input, and then you can see we have many options out of the box. You know, I want to call your attention to the fact that even though this is a great solution for gaming and we have many customers leveraging our real-time capabilities there, we have significantly other inputs that don't necessarily apply only to gaming, so you really have a lot of flexibility here. Anything you don't see here can still be carried most likely with our REST API reader, so don't worry if you didn't see anything natively there. I also want to call your attention to a couple components I talked about before, namely the restream queue, which is where we capture all the errors. I want to point out that it's currently empty, which is important for what you're about to see. And the mapper, which is what handles all the schema management. You'll notice that I have two schemas set up right now. As I mentioned before, I have an input from my JavaScript SDK as well as my Python SDK. So those are the two inputs you're seeing here at the moment. So let's start by playing a game. Let's look at some events in real time. So right now, I'm going to hop over here. I'm going to start playing a game. And as I do, I'm probably going to die at some point here. Hold on, sometimes it doesn't show over video, so I'll refresh real quick. Hold on, I think I'm going to die. All right, I died. And you see that the events are coming on the screen there as I go. So on the left-hand side there, every time I click, every time I perform an action, every time I die, these are events in real time on the screen. And you're saying, Max, this is great, but this isn't really a lot of events. Let's see what happens if you really push more events. So what I'm going to do now is I'm just in a Jupyter Notebook to simulate more JavaScript events. So I'm going to do so now. And just so you can see what it's like with multiple inputs, I'm going to send from my Python SDK as well. So now that I'm sending more events, you're starting to see significantly more coming through the system. In fact, this can handle thousands, tens of thousands of events per second from your various games or different inputs you're working with. This could be server logs, it could be SDKs, whatever you prefer. 
So you can actually see the events coming in in real time, which is really useful. You can even filter on this if you have specific IDs. You can do so on the right-hand side here. Now, what I'm going to show you is a couple things. First of all, I'm going to go to the Restream queue because, actually, you know what? Let's go to the Code Engine first. This might make more sense to show you that process. So I'm going to go to the Code Engine, where, as I mentioned, you have the ability to transform events on the fly in real time using Python. All right, here we go. In the Code Engine, uh, I'll zoom in a little bit for everyone. So I've set up a couple functions here. The first is I'm looking at the input label. So essentially, we have metadata on all the inputs coming in. So I'm looking to see from all of my JavaScript events, which is called Clumsy Bird, I'm going to go to the Clumsy Bird transform down here. And then for everything from my Python input, I'm going to go to a different transform a little bit lower. So what I've done for Clumsy Bird is I've said, you know what, let's do some GOIP resolution. Let's find out from any of my Clumsy Bird inputs, I want to enrich it with some basic country data. So run a test of that sample. you notice on the left-hand side is the original event. On the right-hand side, you should see here, for example, I now have country, region, continent code. And these were all fields that I enriched by doing some GOIP lookup right here. So I added these events on the fly. The second thing I did is for the Python input, if you'll notice here, I'm doing two things. One, I'm raising an exception for about every one out of 10 events. And the reason I'm doing this is I'm just simulating an error so you can see what happens if an event for some reason doesn't successfully go to your data warehouse. So that's number one. The second thing I'm doing is I'm saying for any of these events that have been in the Restream queue for any reason, I want to change the event type, which essentially is the schema output that this would go to, to, call, to be called exception events, and then I'm going to return that event. So let's do a couple things. Let's go look at the Restream queue, which now, as you can see, this was zero literally a couple minutes ago when we checked earlier. But now I've got over 2,500 events in here. And you can even see that the reason for the event is exactly the exception I raised right here. Custom exception to send to the Restream queue. That's what I wrote in the code engine. I can do one of two things here. I can purge this, or I can start restreaming. Restream is what you would do when you have rectified whatever the problem is. So you can try this again. If for any reason it doesn't work, it just comes right back to the restream queue. So I'm going to start restreaming, and I'm going to start sending these events and seeing what happens. Let's hop over to the mapper. So what's interesting here is we have the two schemas that we talked about before. And then I'm doing the restream, which, as I mentioned, I created that third schema in the code. And keep in mind, when we were in the plumbing screen, I showed you that everything that goes through the system is going through the code engine, and then the mapper, and then the data warehouse. Why is this important? Because if the code engine creates a new schema using a programmatic method, the mapper is intelligent enough to pick it up afterwards. So essentially, it's, it is agnostic to what came before it. If it sees a new schema, it will automatically start to map it. So let's check out the mapper again. And now you can see I've got a third schema set up there, exception events. This is the one I created on the fly in that code engine. It's now taking all those events that had some sort of exception thrown and pushing them to a new schema, in this case in Snowflake, called exception events. So you can see how I was able to add an input. I was able then to modify it in the code engine, enrich it with some new geolocation data. For this use case of the Python input, I was able to split the events to a different table. And then I was able to see it automatically mapped in real time on the system here. So some closing thoughts. If you wanted to leverage a cloud-based data warehouse and an ETL platform, I believe that you can dramatically improve data usage across your entire organization, and you can have more reliable data, which of course is, you know, it's really paramount importance if you want to be able to make real-time business decisions with all the data that your company has. If you really want to have the appropriate data integrity, it does require a very uh, rigorous design and a tested implementation. In our case, at Aluma, we aim for at least 99.9% .9 data integrity. Across our entire customer base, we actually have five nines, so 99.999% data integrity across our entire customer base. If you do plan to build your own data platform, I think that planning for something highly scalable and simple to manage and using a data warehouse is very important. You'll need to figure out how you have some sort of schema repository and mapping things automatically so you don't have to do this manually each time. If you do want to integrate multiple sources and have it be a real-time stream, 
item potency is hugely important so you don't have duplicates. And then to make sure you capture any of errors that will for sure occur, you'll need some sort of queue that has the original event and a way to iterate on fixing whatever's going on there. Great. Thanks so much, Max. So uh, as we head into our Q&A session, if you haven't done so already, feel free to send us your questions. It's not too late. Um, we did have a few come in throughout the webinar, so let's start with those. Um, so Max, uh, first one is, um, it, you only showed one data warehouse. Are there other data warehouses that Aluma uh, can work with? Sure. So Aluma currently out of the box supports a few data warehouses and it's pretty much agnostic to whichever ones you want to use. So if you wanted to use Redshift, you could do so. Google's BigQuery, Snowflake, and then we also have MySQL and MemSQL for certain customer needs that we can talk about. But the ones out of the box immediately are Redshift, Snowflake, and BigQuery. And we work the same with all three. So we're really agnostic to this. Great. Okay. Uh, another one you talked about real time. What about batch? Do you or can you only do real time? Yeah, that's a great question. So, so under the hood, Aluma is oriented around being a streaming platform in the sense that we have Kafka under the hood and Graphite and Storm, and, and it's all kind of highly modified to, to work as well as possible and be as efficient as possible. And whenever data is sent to Aluma, yes, it's being kind of streamified, if you will, to get to your data warehouse as quickly as we can, but it doesn't matter how the data comes to Aluma. So some of our customers will have you know, a large file, they put in an S3 bucket or an FTP location. And that's kind of a batch process they'll do let's every every like eight hours. So really it doesn't matter how you send the data to Aluma or how we access it. As soon as it hits our system, it's going through the stream as, as quickly as possible. And whether it's batch or real time, Aluma performs exactly the same way. So it's good for both. Great. Um... What type of alerting is available? Yeah, so there's a couple things you can do. One, everything I showed you in the platform itself is actually a UI built on top of our API. In fact, we usually release our newest features on API first. So this means that we do have a dashboard I didn't show you, but in the dashboard, you can see notifications about any errors. You can see notifications that are just warnings. You can have these notifications be sent to you in an email digest format, either as they happen or in a certain time period excuse me, and then once you have these, you can actually query them in the API as well. So some of our customers use Sumo Logic or Datadog to get these events in their own kind of infrastructure. Uh, you can even set a pager duty with the email system I mentioned a minute ago. So really a lot of flexibility there. If you are uh, you know, want to use our API, whatever you wish to, to do on your own is completely up to you. Great, and it uh, looks like for a final question, um, is there a free trial or way for someone to get in and uh, try, try it out? Yeah, sure. So if you wanted to test this on your own, it's, actually, it's, it's really nice because adding an input takes just a few minutes. Go to aluma.com and there's a, a start now or you know, get started section. And once you do that, it'll, you, know, you can send some basic info to our team here. We'll reach out to you get some basic info on kind of what your use case is and how you want to get going. And our uh, sales executives can help you get $500 worth of free credits to get started. So that's usually the best path. And then you can figure out the best way to go from there. But it's pretty easy to get going. A lot of our customers get set up and, and going literally within an hour after reaching out to us. Awesome. Well, on behalf of Max and the rest of the Luma team, we would like to thank everyone on the line for joining us today. Uh, we hope you enjoyed the discussion as much as we did, and we look forward uh, to speaking with you and joining us on future Aluma webinars. Have a great day.